Church, I'm going to ask you to grab your Bibles this morning and turn, if you would, to this morning as we continue on in our teaching regarding You Need to Know. We're looking specifically at all about your salvation. This morning, turn to Romans chapter 10. Romans 10. Go ahead and flip there, if you would. We'll use that uh, verse, that portion, to launch out into our study. While you're going there, if you guys remember last week, uh, and this is kind of unique, uh, last week was part one, and due to the nature of having uh, a lot of things going on, we didn't get much time, I think some like 30 minutes to get into the message, so this is still part one. Remember, or think like you never left last week, <laughs> that you've been here since last week. We are in part two of part one. We are in part 1B in our study together as we look at this because this very important doctrinal study regarding soteriology, remember you guys are an expert now in that word, soteriology is the study of the doctrine of salvation given in the Bible. If you're visiting for the first time, is anybody visiting for the first time? If you, if, okay, for this young man, I'll go through the introduction. For him, we love you that much. Thanks for visiting. You Need to Know is a series on Bible doctrine that we've paused going through our verse-by-verse, book-by-book teaching to get into these doctrinal requirements to determine if, in fact, you are a Christian or not. Very serious statement, isn't it? Isn't that a huge statement? But it is absolutely true. You cannot go to heaven because you were born in America, and that's the reason why. You cannot go to heaven because you go to church. You cannot go to heaven because you own a Bible. You cannot be going to heaven even if you say you're a Christian. You can only be going to heaven if you understand what it is you believe in. That's why we're looking at you need to know. We're doing this because I'm discerning the times and the seasons as you are. I'm looking around the world and right here in America. And one way or another, you will not be disappointed. Something's going to happen soon. It is going to be either horrifically chaotic and you're going to be glad that you've got faith in Christ. Or we're going to go up and meet Jesus. Something's going to give. And so more than ever, it's time that we look at Bible doctrine. As you are parked there in Romans chapter 10, keep this in mind. Jesus Christ came to save us from our sins. That is the bottom line of the revelation of the Bible. And that's according to the proclamation of the very gospel itself. That in this camp of humanity, there are either those, listen, I know we don't like this as humans, but it's tough, it's true. You and I, humanity, is, is put into either one or two classes right now all around the world, the saved and the lost. Did you know that? The saved or the lost. This week, preparing for this message, I came across uh, a pastor who was reading about from his era, from his time, about the Titanic. And of course, you know the Titanic, the unsinkable Titanic, remember? Didn't the captain boast in those famous words, not even God can sink this ship. Well, God didn't need to sink the ship. Uh, a, a captain behind the wheel of that ship wasn't paying too much attention that night. And an iceberg sunk that ship. In fact, an iceberg didn't even sink the ship. Again, it was the bad judgment of that captain that sank that ship. But that's not my point. You know, the ship sank in horrific time quickly and into those frigid waters of the North Atlantic. And uh, when the recovery effort was complete, the news was sent to the New York office where the Titanic was to arrive. And keep this in mind. On that ship, there were people traveling in first class. Did you know that? Opulent first class. There were people traveling in second class. Coach, we would say today. All on board. Some people first class, some people coach. But at the end of the day, the news that arrived in New York didn't say first class or coach. It said saved, lost, and the names were given. Some people today might be traveling in first class, but they're completely lost. Being in first class doesn't save you. 
I find it interesting, by the way, that airline crashes, did you know who are the first ones to die? First class. They're closer to the impact. You may be traveling in life today thinking, all is well with me, I've got money in the bank, feeling good. Listen, your name is either on a list of saved or lost right now. The amazing thing is that while you're breathing, you have opportunity to change where your name appears on that roster, on that list. How does that happen? It's all about Jesus saving you and I from our sins, the doctrine of salvation. Romans chapter 10, listen to this, beginning at verse 8, Paul says to the Roman believers, but what does it, that is the scriptures, say? Quote, the word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we preach. Notice, the word of faith which we preach. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Note, my friends, that is the definition of the faith that you're to have. Please listen to this. Your faith must be that. A firm confession that you believe and understand that Jesus Christ came, died on the cross, rose again from the grave. If you confess that because you believe it and you know that in your heart, you'll be saved. Verse 10, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, watch, and with the mouth confession is made unto soteria or soteriology, salvation. Your salvation is the most dear thing that you possess. And you cannot separate, my friend, this morning, your faith from your salvation. Somebody has rightly said, faith, your faith, is the most prized thing you own. And that's true, you know, but keep this in mind. The reason why that's true, oh, listen carefully. The reason why that is true is because your faith is in Christ Jesus who saves Don't let Hollywood or, uh, you know, Laguna Beach or Sedona, Arizona tell you that having faith in faith is what you need to do. Have you ever heard that before? Have Have you ever heard people say, just have faith in faith? You know that's heresy? That is impossible. You cannot, nor are you asked by God to have faith in faith. Have you ever heard somebody say, you just need more faith, brother? Listen, that's a half statement. Half statement's a lie. It should go this way. You need to have more faith, perhaps, okay? You need to have more faith in the Lord. You need to put more faith in the scriptures. You need to be putting more faith in God, but don't ever put more faith in faith because that's an impossible statement. Belief in something is what causes you to have faith, and then faith drives you to the object of your faith. And we need to be very aware of that today in our culture. So we are studying the doctrine of salvation, and we uh, are going to jump into now where we just scratched the surface of last time together. Mark it down, number one, you need to know all about your salvation this way. Number one, how is salvation experienced? Remember, we touched on this. Will you mark it down? How is it experienced? Number one, it is this. It is gifted by grace alone. Can you write that down? Salvation is gifted, experienced. Salvation is had. Salvation is yours by grace alone. God's grace. Not my grace, not your grace. God's grace. It's imparted by God. And as I said before, by way of recap, this gifting is a word related to salvation in the Bible. And do you remember this? It comes, it is the type of gifting, the gifting of God's grace upon your life. If you're saved, if you have salvation, if you're going to heaven, is that, remember, it is a a transcendent grace, but not a transcendent grace that rises from the earth upward. It's from heaven coming downward. Do you remember if I extend or if you extend grace to me or I to you, it is a horizontal grace? You extend it to me, I extend it to you. That is on a mutual level. That is an exchange. And you and I are to be doing that as brothers and sisters. Frankly, we're to be doing that to the unbelieving world around us, aren't we? We're to be extending them grace, being a good witness to them. 
But God doesn't do that. God's grace descends from above. I think it's James 1.17 that says, all good and perfect things come from above. It comes down. Have you heard of trickle-down economics? Well, how about this? God's grace is trickle-down grace. It comes from heaven above, and it is a divine grace. That word grace means unearnable favor, unmerited favor. I love saying this. I want to shout it. I am shouting, aren't I? I'm so excited. I don't talk like this in normal real life. It's just that the truth of this, the Bible does this to me. If I go to an angel game with you, I would be just as bored as you are at an angel game. You won't even hear a peep out of me. But when I think about God's grace that is eternal, that comes down from heaven, that is of his own doing, whereby he puts his divine favor upon your life, he just goes like this, boom, on you. I, I, yesterday, I, I sat down yesterday with my granddaughter and watched some new movie of hers about these little uh, uh, Tinkerbell, and Tinkerbell's got her girlfriends, and uh, they're all flying around. If they, can't, they, if they come up to an issue they can't deal with, what do they do? What does little Tinkerbell do? She pulls out her pixie dust and she sprinkles it on it. And, she, and, and, it, and what's impossible becomes possible. Well, let me tell you right now, if I could see you through my cartoon eyes, I see God sprinkling on your life, Christian, his grace dust. He, he, it's just like this. We said, well, uh, where does it land? Well, why do you care? If this morning you're saying, I want his grace, then awesome. If you're saying this morning, I don't want it, well, then don't worry about it. God won't waste his dust on you. <laughs> if you don't want his dust, he's not going to give you his dust. But if you want his dust, he'll sprinkle his grace, and it comes from heaven down to earth. Now, remember this. Number one, in that moment of faith, when someone believes in Christ as Lord and Savior, there is an immediate transaction of salvation in that moment. Some of you were scratching your heads last week. How do I know? Because you've talked to me this week in the marketplace and other places. Pastor, make this clear. I don't get it. Well, listen carefully. The moment you accept Jesus Christ, number one, God's grace is at work in your life. That's how you've come to that moment of saying, Jesus, I want you. The moment that happens, watch everybody. If I'm walking down the street and I'm calling out to God, and I put my faith in Christ. Are you, are you watching? And I step off the curb onto an oncoming Metrolink, and that train hits me at 60 miles an hour, and I'm as dead as dead can be. Where do I go? The Bible says I go straight to heaven. Straight to heaven. Some of you are thinking, no, 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 wait, 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 wait. that's too easy, that's too easy. Oh, wait a minute, wait a minute. You weren't even baptized. That's right, wasn't even baptized. I accepted Christ. In fact, how about this? I accept Christ, and now I'm driving to the baptism. <laughs> and I get hit by that same metro link. Where do I go? Angels are not lamenting in heaven. Oh, he was so close. He just didn't get dunked. Oh, what a shame. You are saved. When you put your faith in Christ, you are saved in that very moment of time. The Bible says to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord. See, our carnality and sometimes some of the doctrines that we've been taught by man, misunderstanding scripture is, yeah, you gave your heart to Christ, but salvation is a process. You're saved in some fashion, but you've got to do all these other things. That's, listen, that's what our friends, the Mormons, do at our door. They knock on our door asking us to become a Mormon, and they tell us our sins are forgiven the moment we become a Mormon, but for the rest of our lives, we've got to atone for the rest of our sins from that moment on. That is not the Bible. That is not what Jesus did. Ephesians 2 verse 4 says, but God who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, even, listen to this, this is love. Would you love me if you knew verse 5 about me even when we were dead in trespasses? Would you love me if you, you know that sticker to love me, to know me is to love me. No, the truth is, if we really knew you, we wouldn't love you. God says, I knew you when you were an absolute God-hater, and I still loved you. It doesn't mean you were going to heaven at the time. It means that he loved you. 
You need to come to Christ. Look at that. Ephesians goes on. Verse 5. But he made us alive together with Christ. Made us alive together. The word is in the present tense. Ladies and gentlemen, don't miss this. Write it down. Never forget this. It means that those who are saved are saved in the present tense at the moment of faith. For by grace you have been saved. <laughs> For by, look at verse 8, for by grace you have been saved. He repeats it twice in that portion. Saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, so don't boast about your great faith. It is the gift of God. Verse 9, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Isn't that a great word? Oh, I'm saved because I had such great faith. Look how silly that is. Don't boast, Paul says, don't boast about it. Don't walk around boasting. (laughs) Yes, Jesus died for my sins, but I, on the other hand, was smart enough to put my faith in him. (laughs) Watch out. That's not saving faith. You're still trusting in your flesh. It's God's grace. 1 Corinthians 15, 50. 1 Corinthians 15, 50 says, what am I saying? The Amplified Version says, dear brothers and sisters, what am I saying? He says, is that your physical bodies cannot inherit the kingdom of God. This is good news. It sounds scary for some of you listening to this, but hang on. These dying bodies cannot inherit what will last forever. Did you know your body's dying? I know. See, there's mainly older people at first service. And I, I appreciate that. I've been up since the same time you've been up. Third service is when all the young people come. And uh, when I say, when, when I read this verse in first service, I can feel this collective, yes. <laughs> Let it die, Lord. Let it die. Because we, kn- we know what we're carrying around here after all, these bodies. I used to put cologne on. I still do, but I used to put two squirts. And I realized this morning, Why? It's a mask to mask my rotting flesh. (laughs) Truly, Lord, by now he stinketh, and at 57 years of age, I stinketh. What is happening? Death. Look, cheer up. God bless you this morning, but you're dying. We are dying. And the Bible says to the believer, are you a Christian this morning? The Bible says, as your carcass is, For you to be in heaven, you can't drag that thing up there. You stink up the place. You've got to experience a change. Watch what he says. Verse 53, 1 Corinthians 15. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Then, when our dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, Hades, or grave, where is your sting? What an awesome statement. Salvation is not only, watch, salvation is not only in the moment you believe in Christ, you're saved, but the ultimate fulfillment of it all is when your body, my body, is ultimately resurrected or transformed at the coming of Christ. That's why people get confused about, well, am I saved or do I have to get saved? If you're saved, you're saved. But listen, there's an aspect of our salvation that we've not physically recognized yet. The Bible never contradicts itself. Are you guys okay? Am I messing you up? The moment you die, watch. The moment you die, you go to be with Jesus instantly. But we've got to deal with your body. We've got to put it in forest lawn. We have to have a service. You're not there. People, I understand people come up to the coffin, oh, brother, rest in peace. I get that part. You got to go through that process. He's not there. (laughs) He's not there. When the Lord comes, the body will be resurrected out of the dust. God will call it back. Oh, man. And the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 4 that those who have trusted Christ will be reunited in the atmosphere, in the resurrection, with their glorified body. No stink. It's going to be awesome. 
It's going to be fantastic. Number two, gifted by God's grace alone means this, that uh, this salvation from that moment of faith being acted upon now, so we go beyond trusting in Christ, the believer moves on, freed from the dominion and power, listen carefully, of his or her sinful nature, the old sin nature. And that's new now on a daily basis. We live out our personal watch, practical, positional sanctification. You say, okay, now wait, what? I'm saved. Are you a Christian today? Trust in Christ. You're saved. Now watch. If you are allowed to live one, two, three days or one, two, three decades from that moment, I am now living out the fact that I am saved in the world that you and I interact in. I am positionally sanctified. We'll talk about this either today or next week. I'm positionally sanctified in Christ, meaning God has declared me set apart from the world and set aside for him. It's awesome. When does it happen? In an instant that you come to faith in Christ. Wow. Your life begins. When your life begins, because we have not yet experienced the death of this flesh, we enter into a brand new, never before experienced battle. And that battle is, I want to do only what's right to God. And another part of you says, why don't we go around town and get drunk and shoot up the town and, and uh, you know, I don't know, I'm just making this up right now. But, you know, the devil side of you, the bad side, the, the old Jack, let's do that. No, no, let's not do that. Yes, let's do that. You now experience the battle. You're born again. You're brand new. From that moment on, you are now living out a positional yet practical sanctification of a born again life. Don't raise your hand. But those of you who have come to faith in Christ, let's be honest. Oh, I'll be honest for you. Before I was a Christian, life was easy. I'll be very honest with you. Before I became a Christian, I made a lot of money. It was legal. But I lived for money, so that's what I made. Before I was a Christian, things went really smooth. <laughs> and then I became a Christian. And a few weeks after I became a Christian, I lost my job. And I'm thinking, uh, is this the way it's supposed to work, God? What is this? And then I lost all my friends. Wait a minute. Wait, what? You're a Christian? Hey, dude, okay, well, we'll talk to you tomorrow. They never called me back. That was the gift of, that was the grace of God, by the way. That was a good thing they didn't call me back. You hear what I'm saying? From that moment on, my life, in some ways, became miserable. The world didn't have its appeal to me anymore. And yet my flesh thought it was supposed to be happy there. But my heart's longing for heaven and I had to reconcile while I, I thought if you give your heart to Jesus, people are just going to march in front of you and throw rose petals on the path ahead of you. <laughs> no, not at all. What was going on? What is going on? A, this is a positional, practical life of sanctification as a believer now. When does that happen? The moment you're saved. But it's lived out today. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 24. Hebrews 9, 24 says, For Christ has not entered the holy place made with hands, or human hands, which are copies of the true, I'll touch on this in a moment, but into heaven itself, now appearing, present tense, today. Guess where Jesus is today? He's now appearing in the presence of God, that is his Father, for us on our behalf. Someone say amen. Amen. What in the world's going on? How, what, hey, how, how was your weekend? How was your morning? So, oh man, I need the grace of God. You got it. Well, how can you be so sure? Because right now, appearing before the throne of God is your advocate, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is requesting air support <laughs> from his father for your life. Grace, father, Jack needs more grace to get through. He's got two more services to do. More grace for Jack. Do you hear what I'm saying? What do you have in store for today? See, I don't know. Whatever it is, Jesus knows. He's up there and he's saying, Susie needs more grace. He's asking. And you know what's so cool? 
He said, I don't know if I have the faith. Well, how about this? Just have faith in Jesus Christ that he's up there appearing before the Father because, listen, the Father never tells his son no. Father, Jack needs grace. You got it. I get to enjoy that based on the intercession of Christ and his perfect merits. Not mine. Not mine. And thank God, the opening part of that verse in Hebrews 9.24 tells us, he never entered some shrine in Timbuktu. He never entered the temple in Jerusalem into the Holy of Holies. Thank God he didn't do that. Did you know that? Think about it. If Jesus was our priest and it was connected to an earthly economy, he would have had to have gone into the temple in Jerusalem, into the Holy of Holies, and make an offering for us. He never did that, church. He never went into an earthly temple. You want to know why? He knew that in 70 AD, that whole structure was going to be torn down by the Roman Empire. And if that structure would have been torn down after Jesus made his offering, your salvation would have been lost forever. The Bible says he entered into the place where human hands have not, has not made. He took, listen, you are so saved as a believer. He took his offering of his own blood into the holy of holies in heaven to the altar that the Father accepts the sacrifice on. Everything else on earth was a model, the Bible says, of that in heaven. And Jesus laid out his offering of blood and it's there eternally. No moth, no rust, no thief can break in and steal it or corrupt it. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 10. Listen carefully now. By that will, we have been sanctified, past tense, through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ every week, uh, every other hour. When? How? Once and for all. You know, I'm not a Pentecostal person, but I'm getting Pentecostal right now. Jesus suffered once. He made an offering once. It is that powerful for all eternity and time. He did it all. He did it. By that will, you have been sanctified. God looks at you from above. You're done. I mean, I mean that in a good way. You're done. Not like, I'm done. No, you're, you're done. <laughs> it's like, do you go to LA Fitness, anybody? I don't. That's crazy. But anyway, <laughs> um, why would I go there and torture myself like that? Because there's people, there's guys. Have you seen these guys walking around there? Their muscles have muscles. <laughs> and it's like, I want to say to them, you can go home now. <laughs> you're totally done. <laughs> why don't you let, you know, little guys like me come in here, you know? Well, listen, God, God looks at you and says, you're done. Because he sees you through Christ. He sees you through the Lord Jesus. You're done. I'm based on what, Lord? You were sanctified by my offering. 